Okay. okay. So for the unit two overview, we did actually cover a little, well, most of 2.4 on Thursday before we left for the weekend. Um, we still have the one last practice problem to do, which is like graphing a piecewise function. So I'll cover how do you do that and um, graph one today. Um, then you can use that to try to finish up your 2.4 homework. Then we are gonna move on to 2.5, which is transformations. So we kind of briefly talked about transformations in a different section, and I kind of broke it all down for you, but I'm gonna do it again because we're gonna actually get to the section where it's all gonna get played out, okay? Um, and that's gonna be section 2.5. Then tomorrow, we'll actually talk about combinations of functions, and um, I think for now, they're only doing arithmetic combinations. There's another kind of combination that that one we'll talk about after the test, okay? Um, so on Wednesday, I didn't want to shift the date because I really do want to leave the weekend for you to do the review, to make sure you're prepared, you know, have everything ready so that you can take the test on Monday. So even though we were able to cover 2.3 and 2.4 in one day, essentially, um, I didn't want to just shift everything up. I'm going to leave it exactly the way it is. Okay, we're not in any rush. As far as the calendar being mapped out, we're okay if we take that test on Monday and just leave it there, okay? So that will give us the whole weekend to help with the review and all of that. So Wednesday, we're actually not going to have lecture or class on Wednesday, okay? So that thing is gonna be specifically reserved for you to catch up on homework. So all of the unit B homework that we've gone over, all the sections that we've covered, if you have not been keeping up with those homework assignments, that's the day to go in there and try to get them all done. That way, when we come together on Thursday, hopefully you guys have seen some of the stuff. You'll be able to know what's going on when we talk about that review. And then hopefully over the weekend, you really make sure all your homeworks are 100, right? Hopefully. <laughs> and then you make sure you do really well on that review because that counts as a homework grade as well, right? So you'll basically have from Wednesday all the way till Sunday night to make sure that your homeworks are all done perfect and you're everything is as high as it could possibly be, right? Again, one that helps for your homework average to be high because that is part of your grade. And that, I think we're in unit two. So we're talking about the college algebra part of those two classes, right? And this one is almost more important than the developmental, right? Because if you pass the college algebra stuff, then your developmental, whatever you did on the developmental can get replaced if your college algebra stuff is better, right? If you're doing great in the developmental, but don't worry. <laughs> It'll be fine either way. Um, but I did send out an email because I did get a question. And I, I think it was actually, I think it was someone from this class, but not one of the ones that comes to class. It was one of the ones that, are, that chose to stay remote. And they asked me, well, if everything's going to get replaced, then what is the point in doing <laughs> the 03 14 homework and the 0314 test and all that good stuff. And there is a good reason to do it if you want to avoid having to take this double sequence course again in the future. So if let's say, for instance, you don't pass the college algebra part, if you also don't pass the developmental part, then you basically have to take both courses all over again. Whereas if you do pass the developmental part, it doesn't matter what you do in college algebra, you'll never have to repeat that developmental part again. That makes sense. So it, it is worth passing, <laughs> but at the same time, if you focus on your college algebra stuff, then whatever happened in the developmental can kind of go away. Okay. Um, my main focus is that you pass college algebra though, for sure. Okay. Um, so hopefully, all of this you know wiggle room here will help us to make sure that all of our scores are as high as they possibly can be coming into that test and you have had as much practice as you can possibly have before that test, okay? Um, I will still be available this time, so if you need to text me or you need to message me or you want to do a Zoom, let me know. I will still be available on Wednesday. Um, we, I'm just not going to require you guys to come physically to class on that particular day because you're just working on homework, okay? Okay. With that said, I did have one more quick announcement and that had to do with the um, ISLO assignment. I've been getting a lot more participation in that since um, the first go around when I had, had to do it that one day, right? And then I told you guys it's gonna be open. I had some questions on well, when is the last day I could do it? 
Um, the last day is going to be the 12th, okay? Now, it won't kick you out if you go on there on the 13th, but I will have already turned everything in on the 13th, so it really won't count and you really won't get any bonus points unless it's done by the 12th, okay? I did get some more. I have to go through them real quick and make sure that all the information is good. If it isn't, I will send the text remind to remind um, and let you know, hey, submit the form again. You got this wrong or that wrong, right? Um, but if it's all good to go, then you're, you won't be hearing from me. I'm just going to mark you off for your point. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's go ahead and go to the camera. So we were talking about piecewise functions before we left on Thursday. And we did get to this practice problem, but we never quite actually got to work on the practice problem. Okay. Now, what this means is you basically have one piece of the graph for this kind of information and then another piece of the graph for this information. Sometimes these numbers are the same and I am not sure if I made a typo there or if it actually should be negative six and positive six. So I'm gonna go make sure real quick. Yeah, I did. So this should also be a negative six down here at the bottom. So do make sure you make that correction there. Normally they have both numbers here. They're the same. So both of these should be negative six. Okay, now here's a good question. Which function, the top function, the x plus two, or the bottom function, the one half x minus four? Which of those two functions will include where x is equal to negative six? The top one or the bottom one? So which one will include where x equals negative six? Mm -hmm. It's got that bar, right? And that means equals, right? So when x equals negative six, I should be using the top one. We also know that this symbol corresponds to those solid dots, right? And then this symbol corresponds to the open dots, okay? So I do have to make two, um, two tables, one for one function and one for the other function, okay? And normally I just do like a little dot like that to represent a point like little tiny, tiny minuscule dot. That to me, that's a regular normal dot, right? For um, a point. But if I'm trying to make a statement, I will make the solid ones like a lot larger, right? They're way bigger than the regular dot, okay? And then the opens the same way, just so that you can signify that it's open. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because when you're talking about these points here and you create the tables, you need to know what those points are gonna look like when you graph them. Okay, and so for this one, I am gonna put negative six here. And because it does have the bar, I am going to use a solid point whenever I do plot this point that corresponds to negative six, okay? I also have to pick other X values, apparently X values that are less than negative six, right? So those would be like worse off in the negative, right? So negative seven, negative eight, that probably is enough for me to graph that. Okay, these guys, the ones that are not included in the information over here, they're just gonna have regular little dots, okay? So only the ends will have a particular dot, like an open or a closed. And then any other, jot, any other points that you pick in this region should have just regular normal little dots, okay? So the same thing here, I do have an endpoint of negative six, but this one does not have the bar, does it? So this one should have an open dot. And if I pick any other numbers that are greater than negative six, that would be like negative five and negative four. And these guys would just have regular dots, okay? So only the end points, the end number that they're referring to, only this number is gonna have that special kind of point on it, okay? And it depends on the bar or no bar, whether it's closed or open. So, Let's go see what we get when we plug these in. So for this one, since I'm using the top, I'm gonna to put X plus two. And for this one, I'm using the bottom function. So I'm gonna just write that function up there just so that we know which one we're using, right? So if I plug negative six into here, I'm gonna end up with negative four. 
If I plug negative seven into this top function, I'm gonna end up with negative five. And if I plug in negative eight, I'm gonna end up with negative six. Now, when I go to plug in these numbers over here, I'm gonna end up with negative three minus four, which is negative seven. Oh, that one's okay. negative five halves minus four is negative 13 over two, which is also negative 6.5 when I got to graph it. And then negative two, that's gonna be negative six. Okay, so I have these points here. And now let's see what it looks like. So one, two, three, four, five, six, three, four, five, six. And I do need some more because I have negative seven and negative eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll go one more negative seven. So negative seven's like right there. I'm trying to make it darker because it's on top of the words. Negative six is here. Okay, so first point is going to be negative six and negative one, two, three, four. So right here, and it's going to be a big solid dot. Then negative five, I'm sorry, negative seven and negative five is actually gonna be here with the regular point. And then negative eight and negative six is gonna be here with the regular point. And so I can only pick further numbers that are less than negative six. So I can only go in this direction. And as I go in this direction, what's happening to the points? They're going downward, right? So I'm just gonna draw the line that way and then put an arrow saying that it's going downward. Because I do have to be going in that direction. Because it says X is less than negative six. So once I figure out where these points are, that arrow would be going to the right because that's for when x is greater than negative six, right? So let's plot this point. Negative six, negative seven, which is down here with an open dot. Then negative five and negative 6.5 is about right there with the regular dot. And then negative four and negative six is about here with the regular dot. And so again, that one is going greater. So it's going to go in this direction. Now, this is a function and they tell you that it is a function, right? And it might look like it might not pass the vertical line test, but it actually does. Because if you draw a bunch of lines over here, they only cross this image once, right? And if you draw a bunch of lines over here, it only crosses the image once. If you draw a line right at negative six, it might look like it touches both graphs, but it doesn't because there's nothing there, is there? It's just a hole, okay? So it is actually a function, even though it might kind of look like it's not, okay? But it does pass that vertical line. All right, so that is actually the official end of 2.4. So just make sure that you're making your charts correctly. Again, if you always have questions on how to set up things when your particular problems in a homework, you can always text me, right? Sometimes you might get functions where they have three pieces, okay? If that happens, you have to learn how to set this up. And I'll actually go over one real quick. I'm not gonna graph it. I'm not even gonna tell you what the function is, but let's say there's three different functions there, right? And it says x is less than or equal to negative two. And then here it says x is between negative two and positive two. And over here it says x is greater than two. Okay, let's just pretend that that's what it said. I would have to have three charts because I have three different functions there, don't I? And I have to pay special attention to the ends. So for the top section, I do have to put the negative two and I know it's a solid because of the bar, right? But I have to pick two other numbers that are less than this negative two. So like negative three and negative four and those would have regulars, got it? For the middle one, I have to include this endpoint 
and I have to include this endpoint, but I need somebody in the middle. Zero is like right in the middle, right? So for me personally, I would choose zero. If it was one and two, I'd probably choose one and a half, right? Just pick something in between the two, okay? Now the negative two, should it have an open dot or a closed dot? Open. And then the positive two should have an open or closed. Closed. And all the other ones in between are just gonna have regulars, okay? Only the endpoints have these distinguished kind of points, the solid or the, the open. Then the last one, I have an endpoint of two. So is that gonna have an open dot or a closed dot? Open. And then if I pick some other numbers in this region, greater than two would mean like three and four, but these would have regular dots, okay? So just to kind of give you um, an idea. So this one would have an arrow going to the left, right? I don't know if it's going up or down or straight that way. I have no idea, but it should be going to the left because this is less than negative two. And over here, the graph can go up, it can go straight, or it can go downward, but it would also be going to the right, okay? The middle, you don't have any arrows at all. It starts here and it stops there and that's it, okay? I just don't know if the graph is a straight line, if it's like this, if it's downward, if it's a curve kind of, I have no idea what it looks like because I don't know the function, okay? But once you plug in all your numbers into the functions, you'll know what the graphs look like. All I'm letting you know is don't forget the arrows, okay? Okay, so let's see, we have, it's a lot of pages, but it's not really a whole lot of information. Um, kind of looks like it is, but I think they're spiking up folks. So in this section 2.5, we're actually going to be talking about Vertical shifts, which basically means you're going to take those parent functions that we talked about the last time, right? Those eight different graphs. Um, all those eight different graphs can move. You can take the whole graph and basically just slide it up or slide it down on that coordinate system. And that's a vertical shift, okay? So a lot of the problems, they're like usually centered at the origin, like a parabola, right? You could take this parabola and you could actually move it upward or you could take that parabola and you can move it downward. That would be the vertical shift, okay? The horizontal shift is when you take the whole graph and you move it to the right or to the left. And so again, instead of being at the origin, it means you could move it over here to the right or you can move it over there to the left, okay? Um, you also have reflections. So like for instance, with the parabola, it normally opens up on its own, but if you have a reflection, then it actually goes downward, right? Um, and then we even have non-rigid transformations. I cannot remember what they're referring to. I think they're referring to the multipliers. So we'll talk about that when we get to that section. Okay, so first off, we're talking about shifting, okay? So it's saying basically look at the graph of this function and compare it to just the parent function x squared, okay? So the gray one here is the graph of x squared and it's centered at the origin and then the parabola opens upward, right? That's the basic graph of x squared. But if you were to graph x squared plus two, notice it's the exact same graph. It's just moved up two units, okay? Now look at the graph if we do Notice the difference between this problem where it has plus two and this problem where it has minus two. Not only is one plus two and the other one's minus two. Okay, that's the difference, right? But the major difference between the two functions is that this one up here has the plus two outside of the square. Isn't the x squared all by itself and then the plus two is just off to the side, right? Whereas here, this two is actually inside the square, right? So there's a difference. When you have it outside the square, it actually will shift it up or down if that were negative, okay? But when you have the two or any number inside the square, it does not move it up or down. When it's inside the square, it actually moves it left or right, okay? And so they've shown you, well, what happens if it's a minus? Well, here's the original x squared. And if you graph this 
function here, you'll notice it actually moves twice to the right. So if it's a minus on the inside, it actually moves to the right. So we can kind of guess by elimination, what happens if there's a plus sign in there? It would move to the left, exactly, okay? So these are the basic transformations. So they kind of summarized them here. I did it in a previous page before we even got to this section, but it's good to have a reminder. So it's basically just saying, if you have your parent function and you have a plus C outside that parent function, it's going to move the graph up, okay? If you have your parent function, whatever it is, it could be anything, it doesn't have to be X squared. It could be X cubed, it could be the square root, it could be the absolute value, it could be just X all by itself. It could be any of those parent functions, okay? If you have the minus C outside, the parent, the parent function, then it goes down. If you have a minus C inside the parent function, then it goes to the right. And if you have plus C inside the parent function, it goes to the left, okay? So I prefer for you, I know they give you this notation, but it literally represents whether the numbers are inside the basic function or outside the basic function, okay? Okay, so it says some graphs can be obtained from combinations of vertical and horizontal shifts as demonstrated in example 1B. So we'll get there. Um, essentially what they're saying is that we just looked at two functions that had one thing happening for each one, right? One graph shifted up and that was it. The other graph shifted to the right and that was it, right? But sometimes you can have more than one thing happening all at the same time. Okay, and so you could be shifting up and to the right at the same time. Okay, and so they're going to have an example of that in 1B. So for example one, this one only has one shift happening. There's only one thing happening to my parent function, which happens to be x cubed in this case. Okay, and since it's a minus one outside, it actually means it's going to be moving downward that one unit because of the number one, okay? If I were minus and five, I'd be moving down five units, right? Whatever that number is, that tells you how much. So here's the regular parent graph of X cubed. And then you need to take that graph and essentially grab all the points from it and just shift them down one unit and you have the new graph, okay? If you're ever confused or you just don't remember what the points are for X cubed, you can just make a little table real quick and say negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, and then cube them. This is negative eight, this is one, negative one actually, zero, one, and positive eight. And then now you know what the points are. Zero, one and one, and then two and eight is way up there, negative one and negative one down here, and so on and so forth. Once you know what the parent function is, use this transformation and just move it down. So now there's a point there, now there's a point there, and now there's a point here. Make sense? Okay. So if you forget what the basic graph looks like, you can just make a table real quick to graph it. Okay. I don't expect everybody to memorize them already. <laughs> I mean, it's great if you do. If you don't, we have a default. Okay. So this one was the one that the paragraph was referring to and it had one B. So notice that this time there's two things happening, right? You're adding numbers, but in two different places. So here I'm adding the two on the inside, which actually means it's gonna go left or right when it's on the inside. And because it's plus, which one is it? It's to the left. Kind of the opposite of the number line, right? Because you see positive two and you're thinking it should be on the right, but it's actually the opposite, okay? The one that is direct is the one that's on the outside. So when I do have a plus one on the outside, that one is very much direct. It's gonna go up the positive one, okay? And they do tell us that here, they say go to the left two units and then go up one unit, okay? So again, I my parent function is also a cube here because of this guy there. So my parent function is an X cube. So you could do that chart again to graph it. Um, we just really need those three points. And then each one of these points, we're gonna move two units to the left and then one unit up. 
So this point became this point. Then here, two units to the left and one unit up. And so now that middle point is there. And then this one, two units to the left and one up. And that's that point there. And then you can just redraw the graph, okay? Now, yes, you could just create created a chart and just plugged everybody into here and got this graph directly. But the way that you're gonna see some of the problems proposed to you, it's not gonna enable you to just do that. It's literally gonna say, describe the transformations that are gonna happen. So you need to know how is it moving before you actually graph it, okay? Now, whether or not you wanna just create one giant chart and just plug all your X values into here to get all the corresponding Y values, that's on you. I don't suggest it. <laughs> I suggest you get used to whatever it is they're trying to teach us, right? Um, but you could, because I always get people that are just like, well, I'm just gonna plug them in there. That's okay. But remember, you do have to be able to describe this stuff, okay? Okay, so it says in example B, you obtain the same result when the vertical shift precedes the horizontal shift or when the horizontal shift precedes the vertical shift. This means, notice that when I graphed them, I went left to first and then up, didn't I? That was the order in which I did it. I did my left movement first, then the up or down movement. All this sentence is saying is that if I would have moved up first and then left, it doesn't matter. You still end up in the spot, don't you? Okay. So shifts can be done in any order. It doesn't matter what order you do them in, as long as you do all of them, you're good as far as shifts are concerned. Once we start rolling in reflections and multipliers, guess what? Reflections mean you're multiplying by negatives, right? And multipliers mean you're multiplying, right? What comes first in your orders of operations? The adding and subtracting or the multiplying? The multiplying. So when we start rolling in the shit, the reflections and the multipliers, you actually have to do those first before you can start shifting things around. Okay. So that's super important. So when we graph those, we have to remember to do reflections and multipliers first before you do your, your shifting. Okay. Okay, so the first thing they're gonna talk about next is the reflections. So there's two kinds of reflections actually. There's this reflection, which is when you have the negative on the outside, okay? So notice it's just like before, insides and outsides, okay? If you have a negative on the outside, it's going to uh, reflect over the X axis. This axis here. So it basically takes whatever you have and flips it either upside down or downside up, right? Depending on what you had. So for instance, let's look at the cube function. This is X cubed, right? But if I wanted to graph negative X cubed, it means this upside would come downward and this downside would go upward. And so then this would be the new graph. And this would be negative x cubed. You see what I mean? Like it flips it. Okay. So that's what happens when the negative is on the outside. What happens then if the negative is on the inside? What if it's like this? Or like this? Okay. For here, normally when you have. Um, let me write it the way they write it. I think they write it like this, where they have the negative on the inside of the basic function, right? This is the general notation. This means it reflects over the y-axis, okay? And so let's look at this one. If I were to take the original x squared and flip it over the y-axis, this means what was on the right moves to the left and what was on the left moves to the right, okay? The y-axis acts like a mirror. So then this right-hand section would actually reflect over here and this left-hand section would actually reflect over here. And it's the same image, isn't it? Okay, again, that's because what happens if you take a negative x times another negative x? What do you end up with? 
You end up with positive x squared, don't you? So it should look exactly like the regular x squared, okay? Now for this one, if I reflect this positive section over the y-axis, it lands here. And if I were to take the bottom section and reflect it over the y-axis, it lands here, doesn't it? Which means it looks exactly like the negative x cubed, doesn't it? Well, what happens when you do a negative x times a negative x times a third negative x? Don't you end up with negative x cubed, right? So that's why they do end up looking the same, okay? But not always are they just nice, cute little functions like that. So we need to know those general rules, okay? So if the negative is on the outside, it reflects over x axis. If the negative is on the inside, it reflects over the y axis, okay? So let's look at these guys. This one says, when sketching the graphs of functions involving square roots, remember that you must restrict the domain to include, exclude negative numbers inside the radical. So we already know from previous section that when you have square roots, if you wanna find the domain, you basically take the inside and set it greater than or equal to zero, right? And if I were to do that for this one with the negative on the inside, I have this, but how would I get X all by itself? But what I have to do here to get the x alone? Mm -hmm. Divide by negative one. And so when I divide by that negative though, it flips this over, doesn't it? And zero divided by anything is still zero, which now you see why this is not facing the same direction as the previous one, right? And now here, if I take this inside stuff and I set it greater than or equal to zero, I would have to minus two for this one, right? And so then I get that same interval that they're talking about there, okay? So I know they just tell it to you, but I just kind of wanted to show you how and why it is what it is, okay? You do have to always take your radicands and set them greater than. So that's for that one, that's for this one, and then this is for that one. Now, we've gone in one direction only. We've gone in the direction where they've given us the, the function. We've like looked at the transformations of what's going on and then we've graphed it, right? They can give you problems in a different manner, okay? There's three different kinds of problems that you'll actually see in this section. One, where they give you the function, they say f of x equals whatever, and it's got all its transformations in it. And I'll ask you to describe the transformations and it'll ask you to graph, or it may just ask you one of the two things, okay? There's other kinds of questions though. They can describe it and ask for the equation. They can graph it and ask you for the equation. Okay, and you need to know, that's how they know whether or not you know this stuff upside down, backwards, left, right, all of it, right? This is how they guarantee that you know what you're talking about, is if they ask it to you forward and backwards in every which way, okay? So yes, it's great if they give us the function, we can tell them the transformation and we can graph it. We know how to do this. What we haven't gotten to yet is what happens if they give me a sentence and tell me the transformation and then now I've got to write the equation, right? Or what happens if they give me just a graph and I've got to write the equation, okay? So those we haven't gotten to yet. For example, two, they're just generalizing it a little bit more, x to the fourth. We haven't had that one. That's not one of our parent functions, um, but they want you to be aware that these things exist. Actually, x to any power exists, okay? Forget the way it looks though. It looks kind of like a parabola, doesn't it? It just looks like a little bit flatter right here in the center, doesn't it? Because the regular x squared is not that flat. It just kind of goes up right away, doesn't it? Right? But this one looks a lot flatter than the x squared. If you look at, um, what is this saying? Each one of the graphs is a transformation of the graph of f, right? An equation of each of these functions. Oh, gosh. 
Okay, so they're giving us x to the fourth as our parent function. So parent function is x to the fourth. When do they talk about it being flatter? I think they do. I know I saw it. I'm gonna cover it real quick before I finish this example. The higher you go, and the higher that this even exponent is, whether it's an x to the fourth or an x to the sixth or an x to the eighth or x to the 10, right? Bunch of even numbers. The higher that this goes, the more flat it looks, right? There's the origin. So like if I were to graph x to the eighth, it would look really flat and then look like a parabola, okay? x to the eighth. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if you're trying to graph x to the odd functions, those look like x cubed, but they also start looking really flat around that origin. So instead of a regular x cubed that goes just straight up and downward, right? It's gonna be more like flat and then going up and then flat and then going down. Does that make sense? So just in case we get one of those, because they obviously threw an x fourth at me, so I'm scared. <laughs> they're going to give you a high power. Um, just be aware that it looks the exact same as the parabolas, and I call these chairs. It's, if it's an even function, it'll look like a parabola. If it's an odd exponent, it'll look like a, a chair. And then the higher that the exponent goes, the more flat it looks around the origin. Okay, But you still should have an idea of kind of what it will look like. So this is x to the fourth. The original one was like this, and it was going upward, wasn't it? So what the heck happened here? There's a couple of things that happened there. Can you tell what happened there for part A? It did shift up. So this little central spot here, it went up one, two units, didn't it? Right? So it went up two units. And then what else did it do? Is it even facing the correct, the same direction? It's not, it's going downward now, isn't it? Okay. When it goes downward, that means they flipped it from top to bottom. Where does the negative go when it flips from top to bottom? On the outside. So we have a reflect across the X axis. So that means I'm going to have a negative outside my x to the fourth. And so we know this one goes outside. And where does the up and down ones go as well? Do they go inside or outside? Outside. Only left or right goes on the inside. Okay. So all the up and down junk happens outside the basic function. All the left or right junk that have, whether it's a reflection or a shift, should happen in the inside. So I've got this negative on the outside of the x to the fourth, and then I've got to go up to, which means I need to do plus two outside that basic function. Okay. And so now they've given me a graph, and I have given them the equation of the function. Now for h of x, because they called it h of x, so that's why I'm calling it that. What happened here? Again, a few things happened here. So what's one of them? It did go to the right. How many go? One, two, three units. So it went three to the right. And then what else did it do? It flipped down, right? Okay, so it flipped down. So we already know if it flips down, it's gonna be a negative on the outside because we just did one like that. But if it's three to the right, what happens? It's minus three where? The inside or the outside? Inside. So then the basic function was x to the fourth. So I'm going to have a negative outside the x to the fourth. And I'm going to have a minus three inside the x to the fourth. 
and that matches. Yeah, negative will make it go down, three will make it go to the right. And so this is all they're asking you for here. Now you're gonna have lots of homework problems because this stuff really takes, like once you start seeing them and seeing them and seeing them, you kind of, you know, you just know what they are now after a while, right? But at first you're probably like, well, let me go look at that chart real quick. <laughs> and then let me go look at the chart real quick, right? Until you eventually get them down, okay? Okay, so this is just basically confirming it's the solutions. It's confirming what we said, right? It had a reflection over the X axis. So we knew there had to be a negative on the outside. And then it did have a shift going upward, which means we had the plus two on the outside. Here it had a horizontal shift of three units to the right, which had the minus three on the inside. And then the reflection over the X axis put the negative on the outside. Yes, I was right. That word non-rigid. So the non-rigid transformations, it's the last concept in this section. Um, and then they're just gonna basically put everything together with you, how many, one, two, three, four problems, five problems for practice, okay? So we do have the horizontal shifts, the vertical shifts and the reflection. There's two more um, shifts. And the reason why these are called rigid versus these being called non-rigid is because the rigid transformations don't change the basic shape of the graph. They just shift it around or flip it over, right? But it still keeps that same mold, okay? Whereas when you do these non-rigid non transformations, you're basically gonna be stretching it vertically or you're gonna be stretching it horizontally. So it's like a vertical stretch is when you grab something from the top and the bottom and then you pull outward, okay? And that's gonna vertically stretch it. You could also grab the top and the bottom and push them together. That would be vertically shrinking it, okay? You could grab the left and the right sides of the graph and pull them outward. That would be horizontally stretching. Or you could grab the left and the right sides and smush them together. And then that would be horizontally shrinking. It. And so what it does is it does distort that graph as you're doing all of that pulling and, or smushing, right? So. That's why they call them non-rigid, because they are going to change the shape. It's going to have essentially, it's still going to look like a parabola, it's still going to look like a chair. It's just going to be a little bit distorted, OK? Um, so for instance, let's see, because they're going to talk about these stretching and shrinking. So uh, notice where it is, right? There's a multiplier here. But this multiplier is outside the basic function or inside the basic function. Look at that one and then look at this one. And then maybe you can tell a little bit easier by comparison. The top one, that C is outside the basic function or inside the basic function? Mm -hmm. It's outside, right? Here's your basic function. And you just have the C multiplied on the outside, right? Whereas here you have your basic function, but the C is actually multiplied on the inside of that parentheses, isn't it? Okay. So there's a difference between this and this, okay? Difference there, okay? So not only that, but what kind of number you're multiplying also has an effect, okay? If you're multiplying by a number that's bigger than one, then it's actually a multiple, isn't it? You're making it bigger when you multiply it by something more than one. So if I multiply it by two, then I'm doubling it, aren't I? Right? If I multiply it by three, I'm tripling it, so on and so forth. But while that would make things bigger, that's the same thing as vertically stretching it because every single X value that you plug in now is not gonna have a bigger Y value, isn't it? So if it had a Y value of five, now it's gonna have a Y value of 10, isn't it? Which is gonna be way higher up in your graph, isn't it? So that's what's going to give it that illusion that it's been stretched vertically, okay? Now, what happens if you have a number that you multiplied by in the front, but it's actually a fraction or a decimal? 
Now your y values are not going to be as big. They're going to actually be smaller, aren't they? So then in that case, they call them a vertical shrink. Okay, so if I put, for instance, let's say for this, I put one half x squared. Now the y values are only going to be half as tall as they were before, right? So that's why this one's called a vertical shift. Shrink, I'm sorry, wrong word, shrink. Okay, so you have to pay attention to what kind of number is in the front, whether it's a number bigger than one or it's a fraction or decimal less than one. Okay, what happens if I did this? This is a trick question because it never happens, but I'm just asking. Um, or this one. Would these be shrinks or stretches? This one, would it be a sh shrink or a stretch? Yes, because this number is bigger than one, isn't it? What about this one? Is this one a shrink or a stretch? It's also a stretch because three halves is bigger than one, right? Two over two is one. And this is more than that, isn't it? Okay. So just be careful. They're kind of in disguise because that looks like a decimal and that looks like a fraction. And you might be real quick to say, oh, it's a shrink because it's a decimal or a fraction, but not necessarily. It has to be less than one for it to be a shrink. Okay. So be very, very careful. You don't usually do that to you, but just in case. <laughs> I wanted to warn you. Okay. The other one is when you have the horizontal shrink. So that's like if I grab the sides of the graph and I either smush it together to shrink it or I pull it apart to make it stretch, okay? And so for this case, it's kind of backwards than the other one. So notice that when the number is bigger than one, it actually shrinks it, doesn't it? And when it's a number less than one, it's stretching it. So it has the opposite effect on that one. These are not my favorite, I'll just be honest. I do not like non-rigid transformations, but they exist, so we have to talk about them. Okay, so again, they're gonna try to point us out the difference between whether having the three in the front or having one third in the front, right? So both of these are going to be vertical happening, whether it's a vertical stretch or a vertical shrink, but they're both gonna be vertical because the numbers are outside those bars. You see that? So both of these are going to be vertical. And because this one is a three, this one's actually going to be a vertical stretch. And because this one's a one third on the outside of the bars, this one's going to be a vertical shrink. What the heck do those things look like then, right? Because that's the good stuff. We want to know what does that do to the graph? Well, they've gone ahead and graphed the regular absolute value. If you don't know what the regular absolute value looks like or you forget, just make a chart. Negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. We'll leave it on that. So what's the absolute value of negative two? It's positive two, right? Absolute value of one, one, absolute value of zero, and so forth, right? And you just plot those. So negative two and two is right here. Negative one and one is right there. Zero, zero, one and one, two and two. So then you have that graph of the basic. Okay. Now, what the heck do I do <laughs> to get the vertical stretch? I kind of hinted to you. I'm going to go back over here. These are going to affect your y values because you're stretching it, right? I told you, you're grabbing the top and the bottom and you're pulling them, right? Doesn't that affect the y value when you're going up and down on the um, coordinate system? Whereas when you're going left and right, those are x values, aren't they? So when you're doing horizontal shifts, shrinks and stretches, you're actually going to be affecting x values. And since both of mine were actually vertical, that means it's going to affect my y values, okay? What does that mean? What that means is I'm going to make a new chart and I'm gonna keep all my X values exactly the same, but these Y values, I'm gonna use this multiplier. What happens when I multiply all of those Y values by three? 
what does this y value become when I multiply it by three? What does that y value become? Six, what does this y value become? Three, zero stays zero, right? This one will become three and this one will become six, okay? So you're taking each y value and multiplying it by three, okay? And then that gives me negative two and six, which is up here somewhere. I'm guessing that will eventually go through that spot. Two and six, same thing. Well, if I could draw it right, but it would go somewhere up there. Then negative one and three is right here. Positive one and three is right there. And zero and zero is still at zero, zero, right? And so then that's what gives it the solution. Notice that this one looks a lot more I've said the word skinny before, but the word that they want you to use is narrow. So it looks a lot more narrow than the original one does, right? Okay, now if they have a one third in front, it's the same process. I can use the same table because this is the basic function still, the absolute value. But this time I'm gonna multiply my y values by one third. So I'm not changing the x values. Vertical shifts, shrinks, and stretches do not affect your x values at all, okay? So I'm gonna take these, I'm gonna multiply them by one third now. So that's gonna become two thirds, this is gonna become one third, zero is still zero, one third, and then two thirds. And so they do have the original graph, right? One and one, two and two, negative one, one, negative two, two. And then of course, zero, zero. So I've got the original on there, but now I'm gonna plot these points. So now I'm gonna go negative two and two thirds, negative one and one third, zero and zero still, positive one and one third, and then positive two and two thirds. And so then now you have this graph here, okay? And now look at that one. Compared to the original one, they use the word wide to describe this one. So this one is actually opening out wider than the original, okay? <clears throat> okay, this is fantastic. I'm gonna do all of that on one graph. I'm gonna have to use colors. Okay, so for the first one, A. And this one, you're definitely gonna have to rewatch in the recording because I'm gonna erase every single time I draw it. So that way I can start off with a fresh graph. And I do not wanna sit here and try to redraw this, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, right? I'm just gonna erase after I draw the first one. So if you wanna get this playback, make sure you watch that little part of the recording, okay? Okay, because when I print the notes, it's only gonna have whatever the last one is, okay? So for the first one, part A, what is happening here for this particular problem? Yes, it's on the inside, right? And it's negative, so that means it's gonna go to the right five units. So you basically take every single one of these points here and just move it to the right and then make sure it has the same kind of shape. So I'm gonna take this one, if I move it to the right, it's actually going to be here now. Then if I take negative three and I move it to the right, five units, it's gonna be it, it's gonna be there. Zero, move it five units, it's gonna be here. Three, move it five units, one, two, three, it's gonna be here. And then now this point and move it one, two, three over here. And so I'm just gonna kind of give it that same shape. I'm trying, but I'm awful at this part. It has like a little hook down there, doesn't it? I tried, <laughs> it's as good as it's gonna get. For you, you're lucky you have pictures, right? You just pick the one that looks like the one I drew, right? So pretty good. But that's all you're doing for that one, okay? So I'm gonna erase this red one. I could leave them up, no, cause I'm gonna have to do, I don't have seven different colors. Sure. It's not, it's just, you have to draw the same image, just shift it over. I don't need to know like exactly all those little tiny points, right? You're just doing like a sketch. 
And then for you, you would just be picking the graph that looks like your sketch. Because right? in the homework, they're all multiple choice. And in the test, you've got the little multiple choice graphs. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll leave that there for now. We'll move to the next one. Now, the next one's got two things happening to this. So we're gonna do part B in purple. This one's got two things happening. What is this gonna do? This one's gonna make it go up four. What is that going to do? Flip over what? Right, flip over the x-axis. I ran out of room in there, but yes. And then I've got to go up four. Now remember your orders. You have to do the multipliers first before you can do the adding and subtracting stuff. So I actually have to flip it over first before I'm allowed to start moving them, okay? So I'm gonna do both of those things, but just watch closely as I do them, okay? When I flip it over the x-axis, this y value that was at negative four is now gonna be at positive four. So it's gonna be at negative six and positive four now, okay? So that's where it would be just for flipping it. But then after I flip it, I have to do what? I have to move it up four more after that, right? So that would make it at five, six, seven, eight. So now the new spot would actually be up here. My eyes are probably not aligned. It doesn't even look like it's above the negative six. There it goes. That might help you. <laughs> okay, now the next point. So the next point here is going to flip, but if I flip over zero, it's still gonna be there at zero, isn't it? Okay, but I still have to move it up four. So now it's gonna go one, two, three, four, and negative three. So it's gonna be there. This one had a positive five Y value, but when I flip it, it's gonna be a negative. So it's gonna be here, but then from there I have to do what? Up four. One, two, three, four. So it actually lands here in the end. And then this one, the y value is zero. So if I make it negative, it's still zero. Doesn't do anything, but I do have to move it up four. So one, two, three, four. And then the last one, the y value is negative four. So if I flip that, it's going to make it positive four. And then I have to go up one, two, three, four. So now it's like here. Now remember these little hooks, right? So the parabola is not going downward anymore. It's going, I mean, it's not going, yeah, it's not going downward. It's going upward now. But I just have to remember to put those little hooks on it, like the way it had it in the original. Okay. And so that is flipped over, but also shifted up four. Okay, we'll do the next one in blue. So this one only has one thing happening, and what is it? It is, it's vertical, it's outside, right? But it's a fraction less than one, which means it's a shrink, right? So this one's a vertical shrink. And all it means is, because it's vertical, I'm going to multiply all my Y values by one half. So if I take this point here, what happens when I take half of negative four? What do you get? Negative two. So then that means the new point would be here. What happens if you take this y value zero and you take half of zero? It's still zero, so it's still stuck there. If you take five and you take half of five, what do you end up with? Like two and a half, right? One, two and a half. So they end up like right there in the middle. And then again, this one, if you take half of zero, it's still zero. And then if you take half of negative four again, you get negative two. And so then I'm gonna draw the little parabola and then make sure you do the little hook. And my little hook. So notice that that one is a vertical shrink. Doesn't it look like they took the black one and just like squished it? Right. 
I think I might be able to draw it on top. I think they're so different from each other that I might be able to get away with it. I don't know though. I think I want to erase it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to erase it, but I'll leave the little descriptions on there. Okay. Just so I can start out fresh and get some new colors in there. Well, the same colors, but different representations. So now we're going to do D. There's two things happening on D. One of them is exactly like this one, right? You've got the negative outside the S, doesn't it? So for this one, it's going to still flip over the X axis. But what does this do? Outside affects the Y, right? Up and down. But inside affects what? The X's and it makes things go left or right. So which one is that for this? If it's a plus one, does it go left or right? It goes left, the opposite of what we think, right? When it's on the inside. So then let's take all of the originals and we're gonna flip them first and then move them left, okay? So we're gonna take the first point. I always go from left to right, but some people just do whatever. But I, I always start from the left of my original and start moving stuff from there. So I'm gonna take this one, I'm gonna flip it over, which means it's gonna put it at positive four. And then I gotta move left one. So now it's actually gonna be at negative seven and positive four, right? The next point is this one. If I make the Y value negative, it's still zero, isn't it? Okay, but I do need to move that point over to the left. So it's now right here at negative four. Here, if I flip it, it's gonna go down to negative five. And then if I make it go left, it's gonna be here. This one, if you flip the Y value, it's still zero, but you do have to go left. Here, if I flip the Y value, it'll become positive four and then go left one, which means I'm at five now five and four. So we've got this parabola image and then we're gonna do the little hook, right? There we go. So that's D, that's this one here. What about E? What's happening to E? The negative is on the inside, so it's not vertical anymore, it's horizontal, okay? And it's a horizontal um, flip, which basically means flip over the y-axis. What does that mean for us? Like as far as changing the points, it means change x values to opposite signs. Just like for these, we change the Y values to all the opposite signs, right? But for this one, because it's on the inside, we have to change all the X values to opposite signs. So if I take this point here and I change the X value to a positive six, doesn't it land over here? It lands right there. If I take this, point and I change that X value to the opposite, which is positive three, it's going to land there. If I take this, what's the opposite of zero? It's still zero, right? So that point stays put. This point, if I change the three to its opposite, it's now negative three. And this guy, if I change six to its opposite, I get negative six, don't I? Doesn't it land right on top of itself? And that's okay, that's just what it is. Okay, so we're done with that one. Now for the next one, what is happening on F or part F? What's going on here? Mm -hmm. This means it's going down nine minutes. You got it because it's outside, right? Outside moves it up or down. 
So we take all of these and we have to go down. So this is actually going to go down all the way to what? Negative 15? Four, five. So the point's probably somewhere way down here, isn't it? That dot is somewhere way down there. This dot, zero, would put me at negative nine. That would put me about right here. This, if I move down, it would put me five, six, seven, eight, nine here. This one going down nine would put me there. And this one going down nine times would put me about here. And so you see, you still have that parabola. And you still gotta draw the little hook. But the whole thing has gone down. And I'm sure my things look long because I didn't do one of the marks right, but they're not all even like the way they are on the graph. But you're right, it does move it down that many units. Okay, one last one, even though I'll put this one in pencil because I don't have any other color. So this one does have something happening. It's on the inside. So when it's on the inside, this multiplier, it's not a vertical shrinker stretch. It's a horizontal shrinker stretch. Okay, so this one's gonna be a horizontal. Now, is it a shrink or is it a stretch? Remember that for horizontals, they're opposite of the vertical stuff. So if the fraction was a shrink for the verticals, it's going to be a what for the horizontal? It's going to be a stretch. And you can go verify on that page that has a little summary. But if this is a fraction, it should be a stretch, which means you're basically going to multiply your x values, because it's horizontal, by that one third. And the stretching stuff will happen all on its own, okay? So if I take this x value, negative six, and I multiply it by one third, what do I end up with? What is negative six times one third? Negative two. And I'm not changing my y value. So I'm going to be at negative 2 and negative 4 now. Here, if I take this x value and I multiply it by 1 third, what do you get? Negative 1, and the y value does not change. We're only changing the x values. Now, what happens if you take zero and you do one third of zero? It still stays the same. And then three times one third should be positive one. And positive six times one third should be positive two. And so you have this parabola here, and they still got to draw those little hooks down there. But notice that this one looks like they took something. If you compare it to this black one that was originally here, it looks like they took that and then they smushed it from side to side, right? They grabbed the left side, the right side, and they smushed it together. And so it's literally the same graph. It just looks a lot more narrow. This one. Okay. That's why they call that one. Um, I don't know why they call it a horizontal stretch. It doesn't even look like it's stretched to me at all. It looks like it's shrunk, right? Um, I don't know. That's just what it looks like to me. Uh-huh, it should be a stretch. I don't like the way the horizontal one, yeah, it's a stretch. That's just what it looks like. Those don't make sense to me, the horizontal one. Everything's always backwards. <laughs> it says stretch, but it doesn't look like a stretch, does it? It looks like they horizontally shrunk it, doesn't it? To me, that's what it looks like, but that's how they label it. Okay, so that was a big one because that one had us doing like seven different ones on one graph. You'll only be asked one and maybe a whole nother problem with a whole nother graph to do a different one. Won't be asked to do the same thing seven times. 
Okay, so for number two, oh, this was important. I uh, might need to stay zoomed in right there. This was the one I was talking about where they might give you a graph and then ask you what, what would be the equation of this graph, okay? So they do tell you the parent function whenever they do tell you this. So it does tell me to use the graph of x cubed, which means that guy is going to be my parent function. You have to start with the parent function because then you will know when I say inside and outside, well, inside and outside of what, right? You have to have the parent function in order to know that. And normally, sometimes they don't even tell you this, they just give you the image. And you have to remember that that image is an X cubed image. It just had some stuff happen to it. Okay, so it could do that. I could give you this and just tell you what's the equation of that and not tell you a damn thing, right? Just give you the graph. You should know that a V shape is an absolute value equation, okay? They do help you out a little bit and they tell you, but sometimes they don't have to. That's how they're quizzing you on not just the transformations, but also the parent functions. Okay, so the good thing to do about all these graphs, if you really wanna see what's happening to it, identify that center point, right? Where the zero, zero was in the parent function. Okay, and if I look at a parent function x cubed, it looks like this, doesn't it? Something like that, I'm trying. Okay, so that center point is actually right here. It doesn't look exactly like mine because some things have happened to it, okay? There's actually three things that have happened to it. Can you tell me one of them? One, it flipped over, didn't it, right? Because I'm not going up on the right-hand side, am I, anymore? I'm going down on the right-hand side. So what, where does a negative, is that, what kind of reflection is that? It's a reflection over what? If it goes up and down? So if this part turned down here, what happens? If this part went down there, it's over the x-axis. Okay, if it flips upside down like that, it's always over the x-axis, okay? That also goes on the outside, doesn't it? When it flips over the x-axis? Okay, then one more thing that happened to it. it again? Uh huh. did go to the left. How many? It looks like negative two, right? It went left two. When it goes left or right, that's actually on the inside, isn't it? What else did it do? Mm -hmm. And down goes on the outside. Up and down goes on the outside. Now, what I also want to make sure is that it didn't stretch or shrink. And it looks like if I go one and one, I get there, and one and one, I get there. So as long as that's happening, there's no stretching or shrinking. Because in the original, don't you have zero, zero, and then one and one, negative one and negative one, right? Those are only like one little corner box away from each other. And there's still only one corner box away. So no stretching or shrinking has occurred here. Now, if that point was not there and it was like up there, then I would have known some stretching happened, right? Make sure you're looking out for that. So those are the three. And so then I'm gonna write my equation. Um, y equals, and I'm gonna have a cube. I'm gonna have a negative on the outside because of the reflection. I'm gonna have an X. Now what goes here, minus two or plus two? Correct, a plus two. And then there's my basic, the parent function. And then now to go down three, what do I need to out here? Minus three. So this is the reflection. This is what made it go to the left. And then this is what made it go down, okay?
So for three, here's the center. And these are still one box away. So no, no stretching or shrinking going on here. Is there any reflecting going on here? Remember what the original looks like. Right, the original looks like that. So did it flip or anything like that? No flipping, okay. So then it did move though, it moved, let's see, one, two to the right. And it also moved one, two, three, four, five, six units down. But there's no reflection or anything. So we're just gonna say X, which one of these goes on the inside? The two to the right goes on the inside. Now, what symbol in here, plus or minus? Minus makes it go to the right. And then the six, because it's down, has to be outside. But what sign? Minus, because down is minus. And that's the equation of that one. It do take some getting used to. Okay, last practice to give us an x squared function. It's important to know what the original one looks like. It looks like this. You do have the point one and one, so it's one box away. And this does have a point one box away. So there's no stretching or shrinking going on. As long as these are only one little box away, nothing's, there's no stretching or shrinking. But some stuff did happen to it. It flipped, didn't it? And this one actually flipped. This one's weird. This one actually flipped two times, didn't it? Because it had to have flipped downward, right? In order for it to be going you know, down. But then it also had to flip over the y-axis to go in that direction, okay? So this one flipped over both. Now this one's gonna be super tricky. Um, I didn't mention it, but let's just see. What else did it do? It did go to the right four. And anything else? It also went down four. Okay, the stuff on the outside is not the problem. I can do minus on the outside and I can do the minus four for the down. So this one and this one are taken care of. It's the ones that happen on the inside that are going to be the problem, okay? This is where the problem is. This minus on the inside has to apply to everything on the inside. So you actually have to write it like that. That's the part that you haven't had yet happen. No one's had a reflection over the y-axis and the shift at the same time. But you haven't had an example where you had to write both of those things. If it's this, you just make the x negative, right? If it's this, you just minus four, right? But when you have both of them happening, you have to put the minus outside the x minus four, okay? And that can essentially change the equation and make it look like negative x plus four, but you have to remember that in order for you, if you would have been given this function, if you were given this function, this is the answer, but this is a good teaching point too, because if that was the function I was given, in order for me to decide whether or not it goes left or right, I would have had to have factored out that negative, and then I can determine whether it's going left or right from the inside, okay? That's a big thing to know, because if you see this on your problem and it's asking you, describe the transformations, you're going to think it's going to the left, aren't you, that plus, and you can't, 
you have to factor the negative out before you decide if it's going to go left or right. Okay, so it's a big, big thing to do. Make sure you do that. That's the end of the section, actually. Let's go look at the homework real quick, see if there's anything crazy in there. Come on, there it goes. So 2.5, do you mind if I go look at 2.4 first? Just to make sure there's nothing crazy in there. We still have quite some time. I don't think we're gonna take the whole class time, but just to be sure there's nothing cuckoo going on. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one, that's the identity, the reciprocal, the squaring, the square root, the constant, absolute value, cubic, linear. And then they ask you to plug these in. Remember, that's the X, that's the Y, right? You have to find the slope and then you can find the equation. We did an example like this. We also did an example pretty much like this one too. So that should help with that one. You can follow that same graph. You can do these by a um, process of elimination, but when you're on the test, you can't do that. You have to actually draw it. But for this one, it's a line when X is less than two, right? So that means a line to the left of two, which means it could be this, it could be that. It could not be this one because this one doesn't have a line to the left of it, okay? And it couldn't be this one either because that does not align to the left. And then this one should look like a parabola to the right of two. This one looks kind of curvy, but I don't know. Looks a little tiny bit curvy. This one also could be curvy. So I would definitely plug some numbers in there. I think it's the top one though. Because what happens when you plug in two? Don't you get like six down here? So there should be a point at two and six. So about right there. So it probably is that one. No, one, two, yeah, six. Where's this one? That's also six. Hmm, that might not help me. What if I plug in five? It's gonna be a huge number, right? Which means it's gonna be way up here, isn't it? It's not gonna be way down there. So more, it makes more sense for it to be that one. Oh God, this was the one I was talking about. Okay, so use those endpoints. You're gonna have an open dot at negative two. Then for this line, you're gonna have a closed dot and then an open dot. And then for this bottom one, you're gonna have a closed dot, okay? So it's gonna be a parabola, a line, and a parabola. It could be any of those, because that looks like parabola, parabola, line, parabola, parabola, line, parabola, parabola, line. Parabola, parabola, line. It should be open on this section. This is the only one that's bad, and that one's bad, because these two are open. Then it should be closed and open. This one's closed and open, and so is that one. And then this one should be closed at zero. That's open at zero, isn't it? So it has to be this one, just by process of elimination. But make a chart and graph it. Okay, just so you can practice it. Okay, that one's not too, too bad. Let's go look at 2.5. I'm curious to what they're gonna give you in here. Dun, 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 come on. So reflection in the X axis of the graph Y is represented by which one? If it's over the X axis, should the negative be inside or outside? Outside. And if it's a reflection over the Y axis, is it inside or outside? It's inside. Um, and then here, if the plus is on the outside, what kind of shift is it? It's no. If it's outside, it's up. You got it, you got it, up. And then if it's a negative outside, it goes down. If it's a plus on the inside, it goes left. And if it's a minus on the inside, 
it goes to the right, which is that one. And let's see, maybe we want like that one we were doing. This is what it looks like, and you're just messing around with the wall, right? So negative on the outside and the inside means you're going to reflect across the y axis, which means all the x values are going to change signs. So this negative four is actually going to be at positive four and four. This six four is actually going to be at negative six four. Okay. So all of these are going to switch. So it probably will look like this one over here. Yeah, those just flipped it the wrong way, right? Those flipped it upside down. Okay, this one says to take them and do what with them? Move them all up. So whatever they were before, you're gonna move them up. So all the Y values are gonna get four. So that's gonna be at eight. This one's gonna be at six and eight. This one's gonna be at two and positive two. This one's gonna be at four and positive two. And so it should be this one over here. This one has a two on the outside, which means it's going to vertically stretch it. So it's going to look more narrow. All the X values are going to stay right where they were, but all the Y values are going to be stretched, right? So what happens if you take four and you multiply it by two? It's going to go all the way up to eight now, right? So both of these Y values will be at eight. What happens when you take these Y values and you multiply them by two? Both of those are going to stretch down to negative four, right? So you're going to have two points at eight and then those two points at negative four. So it's this one. Oh gosh, two things. What happened here? It shifts to the right. And then what does that guy do? Mm -hmm. So it's going to flip it upside down. So instead of the little flat line being at the bottom, it's going to go the other way, right? It's going to be at the top, like a house, right? A roof. So it's definitely not going to be these two because those are facing in the wrong direction. So it's going to be one of these two. Now, which one of those flipped it and then moved it to the right? I think it's this one. You would have to graph it, but I'm pretty sure it's this one. Because if these things were at four, yeah, they were at four, what was it at? Oh, two and negative two and four and negative two. So if it was at two and negative two and it flipped over, but then it had to go to the right. So it had to have gone one, two, three, four. Hmm. I would draw that one. I don't know why I'm not seeing that one, but definitely draw that one and then do the two transformations. Flip it over first and then move it to the right. It can't be this one though. Hmm. I don't know why I'm not seeing that one. I want to say it's this one, but I don't know for sure. I'm like second guessing myself. I don't believe it there. Okay, what is this one doing? Down three. So it was already shaped like this, but you're moving it downward. So it makes sense that it would be this one because it was at negative two before, right? So it's that line, and then you moved it down three. This one's reflecting, so it is gonna change it. It's gonna look like a roof now, and then it's gotta go down one. So it's gonna flip over to a roof. It's gonna look like this, and then it had to go down one. So it should've went from negative two to positive two, that little flat line, but then it moved down one, didn't it? Okay. Now this one, you multiply all your X values by two. Your Y values should stay exactly the same, okay? So let me write these down real quick because I have a whole bunch of points. 
and I have to keep scrolling all the way back up there to get them. So you have negative four, four, you have two, negative two, you have four, negative two, and then you have six, four. And so what needs to happen is that all of these X values have to get multiplied by two. So this becomes negative eight and four, four and negative two, um, eight and negative two, and then 12 and four. Okay, so those become your new points. So if I go look for the graph with those new points, let's go see where they land. So I have negative eight and four. So negative eight and four would be here. It looks like that's the only one that has that point. Let's just make sure all the other ones are there. Um, four, positive four and negative two, positive eight and negative two, and then positive 12 and positive four. Yes, so it's gotta be that one. Oh look, that's the same problem. They might have changed the numbers on you, so make sure you try it, okay? But it's the same thing. But like I mentioned, y'all have a little graph, right, to choose from. <laughs> you don't have to draw it like I did for every single one. Um, okay, that one's gonna move it to the right. So it'll probably be this one. This one's gonna flip it. And then it's gonna move it up three. So the little flip will put it at negative five and then it's gotta go up three. So it actually is this one here. That one's gonna vertically shrink it, which means instead of the Y values being so high up and down, they're actually gonna be smaller Y values. But it doesn't flip it over. So the original looked like a hill. So mine should still look like a hill, just a shorter hill. So it'll look like this one. Here we flex, so it doesn't look like a hill anymore. It looks like a valley. And then it moves it to the left one. So that one there. This one reflects it over the y-axis, but it's the same exact image. That's not it, that's flipped over. And Am I tripping? That is not the same as this one. This one has negative six, four, right? Okay, minus 10 means the whole thing moves down 10. And then one half, we saw that one, it made it kind of like narrow. So it looked like that one. Okay, tell me. It says the basic shape is x squared. What happened to the original x squared? It went down three units. So it's basically just gonna be X squared and then a minus three. What happened to this one? Oh, it already has the Y equal. It did flip over the X axis. So I am gonna have a minus outside, right? What else did it do? Did it move left or right? It moved left. It'll be plus two. Uh -huh. See the little peak should have been at zero, zero, right? And it moved over two. But if it moved over two, it'd be here. So it also moved up, didn't it? How many? I'm gonna do plus four. Oops, my parent function was a square, was it not? I can't leave off the square. <laughs> okay, this one's a cube. And it did not flip, but it did do what? Mm -hmm. So this would be X to the third and then plus three. Now this one did flip. So it is gonna have a negative in front. And I'm just gonna leave it in parentheses until I figure out whether or not I need to put something up there. Did it move left or right? This little central location, it wasn't the origin. Did it move left or right from the origin? It moved left one, which means I'm gonna put plus one on the inside. Now, did it move up or down? Mm -hmm. So for down two, I need to do minus two. 
and now you've got it all. You've got the minus to make it look upside down, the plus to make it go to the left, and then the minus two to make it go down, and then the cube. So what happened to this one? Mm -hmm. So I definitely need to put a minus because it's downward. And then the right. And did it shift up or down though? It stayed the same. So no, none of that. Okay. What about this one? Did it flip over? Nope. Did it shift left or right? So minus one, and then did it shift up or down? So it'll be minus five. I'm not gonna do that one. We already did an example like it. But see what I mean? They don't tell you what it is. What is the parent function there? X cubed, good. Oh shoot, wrong symbol. Okay, and then notice here that it's got three, right? Three zero. And then is this point one box away? It is, right? What about this point? Is it one box away? So then there should be no shift, no reflection. So do not select reflection over x axis because it's still facing the same way as the parent function, okay? And there's no stretching or shrinking if those squares are still one box away, okay? But is there any shifting happening? It does move over this way, doesn't it? So it does move to the right. Did it have to go down at all? No. So that's it. And so then if I'm going to the right, it's just x. Oh no, it's inside, isn't it? So it's x minus three on the inside. And then that's that. What basic function is this one? I'll just do this part. X. What is the parent function of this one? Uh-huh. Oh, I already put it in there. And then the parent function of this one? Yep. And that's the last one. And then here, it's the same thing. What's the parent function of this one? X squared. And it even gives you a hint too in the problem, right? Okay. Oh, this one's a good one. They don't give you a picture at all. They tell you the shape is x squared, but it shifted six to the left and seven up and reflected over the x axis. So you tell me, what do I type in? Minus, uh huh, that's the reflection. Parentheses. x plus six, yes. And then put my square and what goes outside? Up seven, so plus seven, good. What about this one? The parent is squared, but it shifted three to the right and nine down. Mm -hmm. Minus three, good. And then on up or down? down minus nine, yep. What about this one? What, where does the 14 go? Well, almost, we got them backwards, right? <laughs> like this. When it's to the right or left, it has to go inside, right? And it's always the opposite sign. Even though 14 to the right, I know it's positive 14, it is negative, it's minus on the inside, okay? Um, this one has reflect over y axis and then reflect it over. So this has, this matters, this in that order part, it matters big time because it means you're gonna do these things first and then you do this afterwards. So it's not like that other problem where I told you the minus for the y axis had to go outside parentheses. They, they're going backwards now because of this stupid thing here. I hate this. This is like the one problem I hated. I just always got them wrong or I avoided it completely. 
<laughs> it was just backwards completely. Okay, so we know that nine to the left is going to be in parentheses. So that's gonna be X plus nine. Um, we also know that if it goes down six units that I'm gonna do minus six, but it wants me to do all of that first and then reflect over the Y axis. So that means I only need to put the minus here and nowhere else, okay? Which is very weird. It's, I think that's wrong, to be honest. I think it needs to be in parentheses still. Yes, the negative X plus nine, I think needs to be in parentheses. I really feel like it should be in parentheses. I'm gonna go check it and see if it says no. I really feel like that's the one that's supposed to be in the parentheses. What did it say? Did it say I got it wrong? No, see? <laughs> I told you it mattered. This stupid statement right there means you don't need those parentheses that I'm telling you you usually need, okay? But if that were not there, then this x min x plus nine would have to be in its own little parentheses inside the bigger parentheses. Okay. But they saved us from double parentheses with that statement. Okay, moving on. What about this one? How would you do 11 up? Uh-huh, on the outside. And then what about this reflection stuff? negative on the outside, good. And then here shifted to the left would mean plus seven on the inside and then down eight, which would mean minus eight on the outside. I'll let you figure that one out. Notice here, here's zero, zero, right? Notice if I go one and one, is there a dot there? There's no dot here, is there? So this one does have a stretch or a shape. And because it's way up there, I'm pretty sure it's a stretch. By how much? One, two, three, four units. It's stretched up four, isn't it? Actually, that's not the multiplier though. If it was supposed to be at one, what did it multiply by to get to five? It multiplied by five. So it is a vertical stretch. So you would select that. And then the cube would be the identity function or the parent function. And then this would just be five times x cubed. Okay, pay attention to that specific problem. Okay, that is it. I did end up actually using all of our time, sorry. Um, but let me go in here and stop the recording. Do you guys have any last minute questions?